Hi, I'm John Ainsley from Doulos, and this is First Steps with UVM Part 3, Sequencer Driver Communication. This is the third of a series of videos in which I walk through some very simple, complete examples of UVM code, showing you UVM best practice along the way. You can download and play with the source code yourself at the end of the video. In this particular video, we're going to use a sequencer to generate transactions and then pass those transactions to a driver. So we're going to have to introduce transactions and sequences as well as look at the connection between the sequencer and driver. So let's have a reminder of how verification environments get organised in UVM. The basic unit of reuse in UVM is the agent, sometimes referred to as a universal verification component. And you have one agent for each of the main interfaces on the design under test. Where by an interface, I mean a bus interface or a packet switch network interface or a serial interface or whatever it may be. Each individual agent then has a standard structure consisting of a sequencer and a driver on the downstream path that is generating stimulus and injecting those stimulus into the design under test. And then a monitor on the upstream path that is looking at the pin wiggling going on on the interface, assembling those pin wiggles into transactions and then distributing around those transactions to the rest of the verification environment for checking and functional coverage collection. All the communication between the components of the verification environment is transaction level. And those transactions are initially generated by sequences running on sequencers. So the distinction between a sequence and a sequencer is going to be very, very important. Sequences are dynamic. They run on sequencers and generate transactions. The sequencers themselves are quasi-static, that is, they're created at time zero during the UVM build phase. Monitors also generate transactions and send those transactions off to the rest of the verification environment. In this particular video, we're going to really focus down on the communication between the sequencer and the driver. Remember, the sequencer and the driver are each UVM components instantiated within the component hierarchy of the verification environment. The driver is going to wiggle pins on the system Verilog interface connected to the design under test. And if you remember, the driver will find the location of that system Verilog interface by retrieving it from the configuration database where it was set by the top level module. The communication between the sequencer and the driver is transaction level, using so-called TLM, ports and exports. Ports and exports in transaction level modelling are analogous to ports in VHDL or Verilog in the sense that they allow you to communicate between components and they allow that communication to be modular, such that the individual components don't need to know the details of the, commun of the components they're communicating with. So the driver in this case is communicating through a port, the sequencer is communicating through an export, but neither the driver nor the sequencer actually knows the identity of the components that it's communicating with. By the way, the abbreviation TLM that you'll see a lot in UVM stands for Transaction Level Modelling, and TLM ports and exports were actually borrowed from the System C language. So as we saw previously, we're going to have a sequence running on the sequencer. The sequence will generate transactions and pass those transactions down to the driver through the transaction level interface. What actually happens, as we'll see, is that we've got a pull interface between the driver and the sequencer. That is, the driver is pulling or getting transactions from the sequencer through the TLM ports. Basically, transaction-level communication in effect means communication using function calls, where the argument to each of those function calls is a reference to a transaction. We'll see all of the source code in due course. Let's start with those transactions. So to represent the transaction, we're going to define a new data type, a class, that we create by extending the class UVM sequence item. UVM sequence item is one of the classes in the UVM base class library and it represents an item that can be generated from a sequence. On the second line we're registering our class for factory automation, this time using UVM object utils. 
Previously, we used UVM component utils in order to register components with the UVM factory. But a transaction isn't a component, it doesn't have a parent in the component hierarchy, it's just an object and it gets registered using UVM object utils. Then we've got the individual fields within the transaction, in this case command, address and data. So here you would define whatever fields were necessary to describe your particular protocol. And we're prefixing each of these class properties with the keyword rand so that they're going to get randomised when we randomise the transaction object. Then we've got some system Verilog constraints just to make sure that the individual fields of the transaction are going to have at least sensible legal values when the transaction object gets randomised. And then we have the constructor for the transaction class. And the constructor for a transaction should always take exactly the form shown here. So a transaction isn't a component, a transaction doesn't have a parent in the component hierarchy, so the constructor, the new function, doesn't have a parent argument. Instead it just has a single string name argument that takes a default value. And the reason it's a good idea to always include a default value on the string name for a transaction is that there are some places in the UVM base class library where UVM is generating transactions without naming them. Whenever we define transaction classes, it's going to turn out to be really convenient to include certain methods inside that transaction class. So the first such method that we can see here is convert to string. So convert to string is simply a function that returns the contents of the transaction formatted as a single text string. So I'd recommend that whenever you define your own transaction class, you give it a convert to string method. And it's very convenient within convert to string just to use the standard system Verilog system call $s format f to actually take each of the properties of that transaction class and convert it to a string. In fact, there's three methods that you'll typically want to define for each transaction class. The second is do copy which copies the contents of an existing object into the current transaction. It's pretty simple to override do copy yourself. All you need to do is to create a variable local to do copy, take the incoming argument and do a dynamic cast to the type of the current transaction. Then we can simply pull out each of the fields of that transaction object passed in as an argument and copy them into the fields of the current transaction. The third and final method that we're going to need to override for our transaction class is do compare. Do compare is also simple to override, although it looks a tiny bit more complicated due to the presence of a second argument, the UVM comparer argument. This is a reference to a so-called policy object, which is a coding trick quite often used in object-oriented programming. So the comparer object is defining the policy that we use when doing comparisons. However, at least for simple cases, we can simply ignore the comparer object when comparing the state of the current transaction object with the object that's passed as a first argument. So in this case, we're just defining a local variable status. Then as we go through, if any of the comparisons of each of the individual fields fails, then we're setting status to zero and then returning the value of the status at the end of the compare function. So having defined a new transaction class and overridden the three standard methods convert to string, do copy and do compare, we can now move on and have a look at the sequencer and the sequence. So here's our sequencer. UVM sequencer is another standard class from the UVM base class library that actually extends UVM component. So as we've said already, a sequencer is a component. Well, it will be quite possible for you to extend the UVM sequencer base class to create your own sequencer class, and sometimes you'll need to do that. However, for this particular simple example, it's quite sufficient just to use the vanilla UVM sequencer off the shelf without extending it with any of our own properties or behaviours. So what we've done for convenience is just to use a type def to create a new type my sequencer, which is equivalent to UVM sequencer parameterized with the type of our transaction. So to create a sequencer to use within 
the verification environment in this example, that's all we need to do. Then for the sequence that's going to run on that sequencer. In the case of the sequence, we do have some work to do. So what we're doing here is extending the built-in class UVM sequence, which is being parameterized with the type of the transaction that that sequence is going to generate. My transaction, in other words. On the second line of the sequence class, we then register that class for factory automation. Using UVM object utils, which is exactly the same macro as we use to register the transaction. So transactions and sequences are both dynamic, they're both registered using UVM object utils. Then we have the constructor for the sequence class, function new. And again, that uses exactly the same boilerplate code as for the transaction. So both transaction classes and sequence classes have a constructor, which follows exactly the form shown here that just has a single string name argument. Then comes the body task. So every sequence class has to have a body task, and it's the body task that describes the behaviour of the sequence. So generally, sequences will generate transactions. In fact, we'll have a look at the complete definition of the body task in a minute, and you'll see that indeed my sequence generates some transactions. But sequences don't have to tra generate transactions. Each sequence does have to have a body task, and that body task will execute whatever sequence of things that particular sequence actually does. So let's have a look at the definition of the body task for our sequence. There's a bit of code to understand for the body task, so we'll start from the outside and work in. So at the beginning and the end of the body task, we've got some code dealing with the end of test mechanism. So at the beginning of the task, we raise an objection, and at the end of the task, drop an objection. And if you remember, objections mean objections to the current phase coming to an end. When any component or sequence that's raised an objection has dropped that objection, and the number of objections raised goes to zero, then that particular phase can end. So each of the calls to raise, and raise objection and drop objection is conditional on the value of the starting phase. Starting phase is actually a variable built into the UVM sequence class, and we can set the starting phase before starting the sequence in order to allow that particular sequence to raise and drop objections. The idea of making this code conditional is that a sequence which is started directly from a test would typically want to raise and drop objections. Whereas a sequence that started as a child of another sequence has no need to raise and drop objections since the parent sequence would then typically handle the objections in that case. Now let's look at the code that generates transactions. So this particular body task contains a loop to generate exactly eight transactions. So the code inside each loop shows what you have to do within a sequence to generate a single transaction object. And there's actually four steps involved. Create the transaction, call start item, randomize the transaction, and then call finish item. So the individual transaction object is being called being created by a call to type ID create. That's an example of a factory method call, which we saw in an earlier video in order to create components. So in fact, we use exactly the same call to try type ID create in UVM to create components, transactions, and indeed to create sequences themselves. The calls to start item and finish item are used to handshake with the driver, and I'll explain that in more detail in a few moments. And then sandwiched between start item and finish item, we've got the call to randomize the transaction object, request.randomize. And you can see here that if randomization fails, we're using the standard reporting mechanism to print out an error. So now we've looked at the definition of the transaction class and the sequence class, and seen that in the case of the sequencer, we're just using a standard UVM sequencer off the shelf. Now it's time to have a look at the driver. And the thing to bear in mind here is that the driver is going to handshake with a sequence that's actually executing on a sequencer to which the driver is connected. So here's the source code for the driver class. Class my driver extends UVM driver. 
where UVM driver is another standard class from the UVM base class library and it's parameterized with the type of the transaction that the driver is going to receive from the sequence. So all the work is done by the run phase task of my driver. Run phase contains an infinite loop and in each spin round that loop the driver is pulling down one transaction from the sequence running on the sequencer. So here you can see calls to get next item and item done. Those are the methods that are used to handshake with the sequence. Get next item and item done are each methods of sequence item port. And sequence item port is a transaction level port that's actually built into the UVM driver base class. In fact, the two variables sequence item port and req here, both shown in red, are each built into the UVM driver base class. That's why they're not being declared locally inside my driver. So we're calling get next item, and get next item is a blocking method call. That is, get next item waits and only returns when the next transaction is available from the sequence. So when the sequence is ready to proceed, get next item returns, and the driver is then free to go off and process that transaction. So you can see in this particular case, it waits for the next positive edge on the clock, then digs out the fields from the transaction object, wiggles pins on the design under test, and then informs the sequence that it's done with that particular transaction by calling item done. An item done forms the second of two synchronization points between the sequence and the driver. The handshake between the sequence and driver is quite involved. So here for clarity, I've laid out the source code of the sequence and the driver side by side, so we can see how they're related to each other. So either the sequence or the driver could be the first threads to reach the first synchronization point. In other words, start item could be called first or get next item could be called first. And whichever call is called first waits for the other call. And when both calls have been made, then we return from start item and the sequence has a chance to randomize the transaction object before finally releasing that transaction object to the driver. So this mechanism actually implements the approach of late randomization. And this is a deliberate design decision in the creation of UVM. So the idea in UVM is that whenever we're generating transactions from a sequence, those transactions can be randomized at the last possible minute before the sequence lets go of each transaction object. And in that way, the randomization can take into account the very latest state of the entire verification environment. So when the sequence calls finish item, then we return from get next item on the driver side. The driver then processes the transaction object and during that process it can consume time. And when the driver's finished it calls item done and it's when the driver calls item done and only at that point that we return from the call to finish item in the sequence. So the sequence can then proceed and go on to whatever it does next. In order to complete the connection between the sequence, sequencer and the driver, we're going to need to connect the TLM port built into the driver to the TLM export built into the sequencer. So let's have a look at the, the source code for making that connection, which is going to be done at the next level up in the component hierarchy. Here's the complete source code for the environment class. So class myenv extends uvmenv, another base class that is of itself extends uvm component. So like all components, we're registering this component for factory automation using uvm component utils. And we've got the standard boilerplate code for the constructor, including the parent argument that we're passing through to the base class in the call super.new. Then the environment class has two standard phase methods, build phase to create the child components and connect phase to connect them together. So we've got two local variables inside the myenv class, msequencer and mdriver, which are going to be handles to the sequencer and driver objects. Within build phase, we're calling type id create, that is the factory method call to create the sequencer and create the driver.
And then in connect phase, we're connecting the sequence item port, which is built into the base class of our driver, to the sequence item export that's built into the sequencer. So sequence item port and sequence item export are shown in red here to illustrate that they're actually built into the UVM base classes themselves. And the connection is actually achieved by calling the connect method of sequence item port. So we're making the call sequence item port dot connect, passing the sequence item export as an argument to that method call. So now we have a complete verification environment, we can have a look at the test. So class MyTest extends UVM test, it's yet another standard UVM component. And the work again is done by the run phase task. So run phase of the test is going to create a sequence and then start that sequence running on our sequencer. So again, this is a standard process in which, first of all, we're going to create a sequence object, then randomize the sequence object, then call the start method of the sequence object to start that sequence on a particular sequencer. We're using the factory method called type ID create to create the sequence. So again, I'd remind you that you should always use the factory method whenever you're creating a UVM component, a UVM transaction, or a UVM sequence. We're randomizing the sequence object before we actually start the sequence by a call to sequence.randomize. Then before we start the sequence, we're setting the starting phase member of the sequence object that we saw being used within the body task of the sequence. Then finally, we call sequence.start to start this sequence running on the specific sequencer. That is the sequencer M underscore sequencer within our environment. So that's it. Now I've talked through the complete example of sequencer driver communication in UVM. Throughout these examples, we've been using the DULOS easier UVM coding patterns. Easier UVM is an approach to learning and using UVM that's intended to make UVM easier to get to grips with, particularly for people who don't have a strong object-oriented programming background. So in Easier UVM, you put together your UVM code using just three standard coding patterns. Pattern 1 for components and Pattern 2 for transactions and sequences. So coding pattern one is used for creating quasi-static UVM components, that is components that are constructed during the build phase at time zero. Components are registered for factory automation using the UVM component utils macro, and the constructor or function new of each UVM component takes a second argument giving the parent to that component. The UVM component class can also contain the standard phase methods, including build phase, connect phase, and run phase. Coding pattern 2 is for UVM objects that are created dynamically during simulation and that are not part of the UVM component hierarchy. So in coding pattern 2, the class is registered for factory automation using UVM object utils as opposed to UVM component utils, and the constructor doesn't take a parent argument. Then pattern 2a for sequence items would typically include at least the three standard utility methods, convert to string, do copy and do compare. Pattern 2b, on the other hand, for sequences, always contains the body task, which is used to describe the behaviour of the sequence. Now you can download the source code for this example from the URL shown in the middle of this slide. The archive that you'll download will also contain some script files for running these examples on common system Verilog simulators. So at DULOS, we deliver training classes worldwide. And on this slide, you can see a summary of the main topic areas that we cover, which include hardware design, embedded systems, ARM, ESL, and hardware verification, obviously including system Verilog and UVM training. If you want further details, do visit our website at www.dulos.com.